And let's see what kind of a group we get. All right, now I wonder if they hit the paper. No, I did. Yes, I did. So how did I ever come up with a $30 scope and rings? <laughs> well, someone was looking on one of the online selling sites and saw this and said, hey, can you believe they're selling a three to nine by 40 rifle scope for $30 and they include rings with it? What kind of a piece of junk is this? I said, let's dive in and find out for 30 bucks. I'll spend that much money just to find out what plastic garbage they're selling. And right off the bat, I thought I was on the right track because it came in this plastic bag and I ripped it open and there was the box and it has a bit of a bend in it. And I thought it's probably broken already. So I didn't go any farther than this. We're going to find out what's in here. Oh boy. I don't hear any rattling. Here are those rings. Tightly packed. Oh, and they're high rings. Yeah, these are gonna be real cute. I hate high rings, but hey, they are free. They feel like aluminum. They're actually finished pretty nicely. No scratches on them, nice and smooth. And they've got the clamp style for a top of 22 rim fires. By the way, these are called high mount see-through rings. Questionable for effective use, but some folks like them. You're supposed to be able to see your open sights through the bottom and then your scope sits on top. We might give those a try, but generally I like my scope to sit low. So here's what comes inside of our little box. A scope wrapped up in a little bit of protection, but it is in one piece. Wanted to show you what comes in the package. Actually has some nice little scope covers on the uh, usual rubber band springy elastic. That's functional. You can see through them. I've had those in the past. And then I want to look at the scope. Now here's what we look at. I'm going to treat this scope like I would any other high dollar scope, medium price scope. We're going to run it through all the paces and I've written down exactly what we're going to do. Here are the steps. One, we're going to look at it and feel it and just see how quality or junky it feels. We're going to look at the internal constructions and scan it inside with a flashlight. We're going to test the smoothness and the adjustments on the power ring, the diopter ring, the turret caps and the turrets. Then we're going to look for clarity, resolution, sharpness, contrast, and flare control outside. We're going to look for parallax issues, then a reticle movement and consistency. We're going to zero it and check for the zero consistency while we change the power settings because that sometimes changes things. We're going to see if it's really waterproof by throwing it underwater. <laughs> We're going to check it for recoil resistance or durability by putting it on ever more heavily kicking rifles like a 375 H&H Magnum. All right, look and feel. I am really surprised this is not a cheap plasticky thing. It even has aluminum caps on the turrets. So it feels smooth and clean and it looks smooth and clean. Um, it feels good and solid. I don't hear anything rattling <laughs> for $30. I'm kind of impressed. Now the internal construction, let me get a flashlight and look into this. Now, I want to see down inside of this scope. I'm going to take a flashlight. I'm going to shine it in there, and I'm going to look for any screws or glue or interior pieces that might appear to be broken. Don't see much through the objective lens, but I'm getting some good blue reflection, which indicates that there has been some coatings on this thing. And those anti-reflection coatings are important. It looks pretty clean inside. I don't see anything to suggest shoddy workmanship. Huh, kind of surprising. Nice clean duplex crosshair, nice and sharp. Don't see any scratches on any of the exterior lenses either, so, so far so good. Now, what about the smoothness of all the moving parts? You can really tell a lot by doing that. Well, the caps come off nice and easily, finely threaded, and they go on once you get them started nicely. It's not dirty, the nice clean clicks. I'm hearing the clicks on these guys. This is good. I can feel and hear the clicks when I turn the turrets. Whether they're accurate in the field, we'll find out. Now there's a rubber gasket here, which tells me that this is not going to be waterproof with the caps off. That used to be fairly common on scopes. It's a little different these days, but you turn that turret cap down and seal it against that ring and you should just be fine for waterproofness. We'll test that out when we dunk it. Now, what about the power ring? Sometimes those turn really sloppily or hard. 
boy, this is nice and smooth, guys. I don't feel anything gritty in there. Wow, that's nice. Pretty impressed. Now, the diopter ring, this is the old style where you turn the entire piece up. There's a lock ring right here. I'm going to loosen that lock ring. And that turns nice and smoothly, too. Threads look clean. And then you turn the entire eyepiece in and out to get it so that your eye sees the reticle sharply. Parallax, I'm going to guess, is adjusted at 100 yards. We'll find that out in the field. But, golly, so far, I'm liking uh, my first two tests, look and feel, internal construction scan. And then the third one, the smoothest of the power ring, the diopter, the turret caps, and everything is really checking out. I am surprised by it. Actually, I'm shocked by this. $30? Crazy. Let's look at some uh, of the specs that came with it. This is called a... It looks like CV Life 3 to 9 by 40 rifle scope, and it's supposed to have a duplex crosshair. It does 3 to 9 power. Yep, quarter MOA cap tactical turrets. I wouldn't call them tactical, but they are marked as quarter. We're gonna check that out. Quarter MOA, of course, means one click means you should move it one quarter of an inch at 100 yards. Fully multi coated lenses. Wow, fully multi coated. I could see that there's some coatings on there by that color, but fully multi coated. There's really no way to check that. You'd have to tear it apart, but we're gonna take their word for it. How this will be resolved is by the brightness of field and contrast control. If we can look at the sun close to the angle of a low sun so that it shines right into this lens and we don't get an orange glare and haze and flare and everything, that suggests it probably is fully multi-coated because those coatings control that reflection bouncing mess that you get. So that's pretty impressive if they really are fully coated. It's supposed to be waterproof, shockproof, fogproof, nitrogen purge. It's kind of standard stuff with scopes these days. So far, so good. And of course, it says it comes with these beautiful rings <laughs> sunshade caps. I do not see any sunshade caps. I do like the way the uh, objective lens is set back a little bit from the end. That always protects it from getting more easily dinged and scratched. Maybe they mean the covers are supposed to be the sunshade caps, but it's not a sunshade. They're just covers. All right. What else we can tell you about? It just tells you how to how to mount it, set the eye relief. It does not say what the eye relief is, but we can check that. Oh, wait a minute. Here it is. 3.5, three and a half inches of eye relief. I'm going to show you guys a real quick trick for um, checking out your eye relief using a sheet of paper and a ruler. And here is our ruler. And I am going to put the eyepiece as best I can level with the start of the measurements. One, two, three, four inches on the way out. And I'm going to turn it around so that I can bend this paper up and make a background for the light to shine upon. And I'm going to shine a flashlight in the objective end of this baby like this and see the light on the page and make it sharp. When that light is a sharp circle instead of a fuzzy one, bingo, that is my eye relief. And the measurement says right now, it looks more like two and a half, not three and a half. That is on nine power. Now let's turn that down to three and see what happens. I'll bet you that's where they're gonna get their three and a half inches. Yeah, that's changed it already. So backing it off, no, I am nice and sharp at two and three quarter inches, eh, almost three inches. So they fudged that one a little bit. So we'll give it a good two and three quarter to maybe three inches to the low power, but boy, your, your high power setting, if you're gonna be shooting a high kicking rifle at nine X and you've only got ooh, two and a half inches of eye relief, you could easily get scope dinged by this baby. It's supposed to be made out of 6061 aircraft grade aluminum, standard stuff on a lot of scopes these days. Uh, the diopter adjustment is supposed to be two, plus or minus two on your diopter. That takes care of most eyes. So I think that's all we need to know. Now we need to mount it on some rifle sound. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to stick it on a 22 rimfire because that does not have much recoil and that thing should perform quite well on there. We may have an issue with parallax, however. If this thing is parallax adjusted to be focused at 100 yards, you're going to lose a lot of your potential for shorter range shooting with a 22 because most of your 22 rimfire work starts at 10 yards and goes out to maybe 75. So ideally, I'd like to see it uh, parallax free at 50 yards or have a parallax adjustment, but you're not going to get that for $30. But we'll test this with the 22 and just see how effectively it works. And gosh, I think we're going to mount it up and go.
So let's start with the 22 and we'll work our way up and see if we can't break this $30 gem. All right, this is my jury rig set up to test the scope on a grid pattern at 50 yards. And the scope is a quarter MOA at 100 yards because we're at 50, we've got to double it. But let's just see if we can't turn some adjustments and have it come back. We're gonna dial up, which means it's gonna look like it's going down. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That should have moved it an inch. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That should have moved it two inches. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, three inches. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, four inches. Now let's go back. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Getting a little mushy and coming back. I'm not getting a good clean click. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Looks pretty close from what I'm seeing here. Now let's do the windage. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nice. One, two, eh, same thing. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, I feel like I might've gotten one extra click in there. All together, that's not looking too bad, guys. And this is not a dial-up scope for being out in the field hunting. It has turret caps. So the idea is you zero it and leave it there. But I think we're getting some pretty precise adjustments on this. I'm pretty impressed with that. I don't know how sharp I'm seeing it through this lens with this setup, but when I look through it with my eye, as I'm supposed to, it looks pretty darn good. That is a nice sharp target, guys. Good, crisp, sharp crosshair, sharp target. And we're going to have some parallax because this is supposed to be parallax adjusted for 100 yards and I'm at 50. So when I move my eye, yeah, let's move my head here behind the scope. I'm seeing that crosshair cover about an inch. Yeah, so we're moving about an inch. We'll find out when we shoot. The big thing is turning the power ring. When you make your adjustments from 3X and screw it up to 9X, those internal movements of the erector tube can move left, right, and up and down if it's not perfectly concentric. And then you end up with your groups landing two or three inches off of the other settings. And that's kind of a critical thing. So we're going to check for that as well. All right, the sun is shining right on the front of this lens, as you can see. And the camera is recording the same target, so we can see the flare, if any. Now, some of that flare might be actually coming from the lens itself. You can see the sun's hitting that as well. So I'm going to slip around here and uh, put a shadow over the camera lens and see if that makes a difference on the actual scope. Here's shadowing on the scope. There we've got the scope covered. There's exposed. See if that makes a difference. Looks to me like that flare is pretty well controlled. Yep, that's camera. I'm holding my hand over it now. See that little circle of light? That's from the sun hitting the camera lens. That scope itself is doing really well. I think it really is fully multi-coated. Amazing. Now I'm looking at the sun almost directly into that scope. It's off to the side maybe four to eight degrees at the most. So it is really shining and we're looking at a sagebrush back there in the snow. And you can see some glare, especially up in the left corner. But the contrast control is pretty good. I'm pretty impressed with that. I have my hand kind of covering the lens of the camera and that doesn't seem to be making much difference. So the flare you're seeing there on the left side, just above the cross here is, the, is from that scope. But if I had a deer out there in that sagebrush, I think I'd still be able to target him. All right, we're going to proof our rifle by shooting at 25 yards with a proven shooter. I'm shooting Winchester's PowerPoint ammo, which is usually pretty darn accurate in this rifle. This is the Kimber 22 with a loophole scope on it. I don't know what it's been zeroed for. I think I had it set up. Yeah, I need to dial her down. Had it set up for some low energy rounds. There we are, dead center. In the red bull.
All right, that establishes the accuracy of this rifle. Now we're going to put that cheapy scope on and see how it performs. Okay, we know how our rifle uh, is able to goop here at 25 yards, so now we've got the new scope on. And I think we're going to start off at three power, shoot a group, crank it up to six, shoot another group, crank it up to nine, shoot another group, and we'll see if it's moving the center of the zero. Yep, I've got some issues here. We're going to turn the eyepiece out. There, we're getting a nice, sharp reticle. This is adjusting for your eye, so it's sharp on the reticle. Beautiful. Target looks pretty sharp too. Of course, at 3x you expect it to be. I am going to go for the upper left red dot. And let's see what kind of a group we get. Taking care to center my eye in this scope because I know it's going to have parallax issues at this close range. That should be it. I think I put four in. Yes. All right, now I wonder if they hit the paper. No, I did. Yes, I did. Tight little group way over there. I was not aiming anywhere close to that. So, of course, my scope is not sighted in for this rifle. What am I thinking? <laughs> but, wow, nice tight group. Look at that. But I think I need to bring that rifle. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, at 25 yards, you've got to move four times more than you would at 100 yards. Quarter click at 100 is only a 16th click at 25. So left, we're going to go 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. That should be an inch. 1, 16. That should be two inches. Now, let's just shoot another group at that just to see if this is moving properly. We're going to aim at the same spot. That's the red dot up in the left and we'll see if we come over two inches looks like we're doing it yeah looks like it did it just about right golly that's pretty good let's bring it over some more there's two inches nice pretty crisp clicks on that thing so that's one, two. Should give her 16 more, I should be there. One, two, three, 16. God, there's not much backlash or anything in there. I'm pretty impressed with the adjustments on that turret. <laughs> but $30 scope, guys, I gotta tell you, I am pretty darn impressed. Now, I can't show you the view through here. I've tried it, but boy, I'm seeing all the lines on it. Uh, not perfect at higher power now because of the parallax, which means, of course, it's not focused. I'm going to dial her down to three again, and now we're going to shoot at our red dot. We should be right there. And that's our four. Oh, right on. So this thing is adjusting. Its horizontal adjustments and windage adjustments are just right. It's coming over just as it should. So let's go down now and see if it tracks that way. One, two, three, four. Now this one does not click as precisely as the other. I can't tell if I hit two sometimes. It feels almost like I jumped twice when I thought I was going once. That should have been an inch. That should have been two inches. That should have been three. I might be off one or two on those clicks. They're a little bit mushy. It's not as nice as the windage style, but I think we'll be pretty close. Let's give it a try. Again, I'm aiming at the upper left red bullseye. Oh yeah, it's all right there. Two, three, four, perfect. Golly, <laughs> I've got to tell you guys, I'm impressed with this thing. Absolutely impressed. Now let's see what happens if I go from three power up to six. So what I'm going to do is move over to the upper red dot on the right to get a clean target. I should still be striking low though. I haven't made any adjustments for going higher again. So I should be four inches below the red dot, but I want to see if the center of my group moves significantly from where the setting was at three. 
because sometimes with a cheaper scope they won't have the precision in for that sort of dialing when you turn your power. So now I'm at six. Six X, upper red bullseye. I'm seeing some holes that have moved to the left about an inch. Oh yeah, it looks. So I'm a good three quarters to an inch left. That is not far off from my three power setting. I think we're okay. It's a little bit, maybe a quarter inch further to the left, but I'm pretty pressed. Now we're gonna go to nine. The target's getting pretty fuzzy because of that parallax issue that we discussed earlier. I only did three shots on that one. That, that was enough to determine what's going on. I'm always impressed at how accurately this rifle shoots these power points. If I aim at that same spot, I'm gonna drop them into those previous three. So let's just see how these change from the last three. Yeah, I would give this guy a passing grade on consistency. Now I wanna come back up. That should be four inches. I should come back now to that aim point. So once again, I'm gonna be aiming at the upper right bullseye and the uh, bullets ought to land there if this thing returns to zero. Got my hopes up. So far it's been performing like a champ. A $30 champ, this is crazy. Going to keep it at nine power. Looks like it's right there. See that one just a little bit out of the bullseye. Yeah, for this blurry sight picture I got, I think I'm doing pretty well. All right, I think we've passed the tests on turret adjustments and power ring changes. And you'll have to take my word for it that this thing is sharp. You know, with a nice bright day like this, it should be. But I am really impressed with the resolution of this. I'm able to read the, the words on there. Obviously, I've got to turn the power down because of the parallax issue. So this scope appears to be focused, I'm guessing, at 100 yards. And asking it at nine power to have a sharp image at 25 yards is just asking the impossible. But as you can see, it was good enough to shoot some pretty nice groups. So what we're going to do now is see if we can't brutalize this thing. We're going to put it on some hotter kicking rifles. The question being, can you spend $30 on a scope like this and get it to work on a deer rifle? I don't know if I'm going to put it on a 243-ish or maybe start with a 223. I think it would be fine on a 223. I think you're going to take a bigger jump up and go to a 243, six millimeter, six five creed, or something in that range. I'll see what I've got, then I can quickly mount this thing on, and then we'll go out to 100 yards and see if we can shoot it, and if anything breaks, and if that lives through that, we're gonna jump up right up to a 375 H&H. &H. All right, I've decided to put the scope on a 6.5 PRC. <laughs> That's significant recoil, about like a 270, and that puts it in the category of a 308 Winchester, 708, little more punch than a 6.5, a little more recoil than that, little less than a 30 out six. So it's kind of what we would most of us be using for deer hunting. So if you're going to try to get a scope like this for a deer hunting rifle, I think it's a fair test. We're going to see if some recoil will beat it up. Now I've been roughly shooting here to get zeroed. I don't know how close I am for hundred yards. I was looking pretty close at 25, but I wanted to put a bunch of rounds through it. And I put about eight through this thing just to see if I could break that scope. So far, so good. Everything's looking great. And I'm still impressed with the uh, visual quality and the clarity of everything. So we're going to get a camera rolling on a 100-yard target now and see if I can get on paper. And we'll try for that bottom target out there at 9 power. Looks like I'm just off the left edge. So a good 6 inches. I think I'm seeing a spot uh, right and low, two inches right and low by that target dot. One and a half left and up two. Okay. Right under the bullseye. Right. Pretty nice clean adjustments. Well, that's close enough. We want to see how it holds in there. Made a pretty good adjustment that time within the uh, inch, inch and a half accuracy of this rifle. I'm forgetting which ammo it was best with, but this 
Hornaday precision stuff with the ELDX bullets usually pretty darn good. All right, looks like I went an inch to the left and a little bit lower. It was still hanging in there. It was getting pretty hot. Last time I shot this rifle, I had a suppressor on it. I should have probably put that on before doing this. Right there by the other one. Yeah, it's about an inch, inch and a quarter group. Okay, going to let that barrel cool. And we're gonna make some adjustments. Pretty much our group is two inches low and an uh, inch and a half to the left. All right, let's crank this baby up four. One, two, four. Now let's go right. One, two, four. Okay, let's see if we made our move. Aims for the same spot, center bullseye. I'm getting about an inch of parallax movement here. So I need to really hold steady. Nicely centered. Right where it was supposed to go. You know, that's within its accuracy potential. Yeah, I think my assessment of this scope to this point, durable enough for a 6.5 PRC class of rifle. It's dialing pretty consistently. I don't recommend anybody go out and actually dial for competition with this. That scope is not it. built to be a dialing scope for compensating for drops and wind deflections and such. But once you zero it, it seems to want to hold it. it certainly did with the 22. It seems to be doing it with this one. I think at this point, it's just a matter of shooting, shooting, and shooting, and see how long this thing lasts, but I'm not gonna burn up all my expensive ammo playing that game. But I am willing to put this thing on a 375 H&H for a few shots, see if maybe that will set something loose on the inside. Well, here it is, guys. We've got a $30 scope on top of a 375 H&H rifle. If this doesn't break this scope, wow! <laughs> so what have we got, 300 grain bullets? Yes, 300 grain, Swift A frames from Remington. These are gonna be putting out, uh, gosh, it's gotta be close to 50 foot pounds of recoil energy. I'll look it up later. And you will notice I'm wearing a sissy pad, not because I'm a sissy, but because I'm smart. Why suffer if you don't have to? Double ear protection, double shoulder protection. Prepare to get brutalized. I bore sighted this just looking down the bore. I think I'll be on paper. And mainly we're here to find out what the recoil damage is going to be to this scope. Well, it's going to go flying in one piece, one shot. We well, don't know. Yeah, I may just do this old trick. Dead center on the lower target. Got to hold my head back from this scope, guys, because it's potential scope bite. This has got a very short eye relief. Like I'm straight down two inches. Well, once again, the scope is still there. So now I'm gonna put another hole out there and see if things are changing. And it might shift internally to where the scope is no longer directing traffic properly, shall we say. Where'd that look? So now we have moved two inches to the left. So I think we may be stretching the limits on this scope because it just jumped two inches to the left. Shouldn't have done that. Yeah, barrel's not too bad. I think we'll spend one more. That's right in between the other two. Folks, the scope is still here. If you're breaking a scope from recoil, what's likely to happen is that the lens element that has the reticle etched on it will shift in its mount if it's not screwed down really well. The best ones, they'll put them in a little bit of a frame and then they'll mount that metal frame inside of the tube. The cheapy ones will just glue it in. This doesn't appear to be a cheapy one that's just glued in. I can't promise you anything, but oh my gosh, the crosshair is still sharp. It hasn't changed at all. When they do shift, then they'll be out of focus. And the target's still in focus at 9X. <laughs> Everything still looks good. I just honestly can't believe it. $30 scope. Well, I think about the only thing we have left to do now is find out if this thing's waterproof. And the way it's been performing so far, I don't know, I kind of expect it to stay on the surface and move under its own power or something. All right, let's take it off of that rifle and go drown it. All right, time for the waterproof test, folks. Here's our little scope, nice and dry. Caps are tight. I think that's mandatory. You can see it's got the rubber seals at the base. Bet if you open those, mm -hmm, not so good. It says right here, it's nitrogen purged. See if it does its job. Goodbye, little scope. Now you see a few little bubbles 
right along here, there's always a little bit of air trapped under things that comes out. What you want to look for and not see are an endless stream of bubbles. I see one little bit of bubble right there that could be a problem. That's usually the joint right here at the turrets. This looks like a one piece though, so I think we're okay. A lot of the older scopes would have this piece joined to the center and then this piece joined and you could get leaks right there, but anymore they pretty much turn them all out of one piece of aluminum. And that's what they've done here. I'm gonna put the eyepiece in first this time. There was a bubble right here on the power ring. I'm gonna put that back in again. Saw another one pop out right there. Now that could just be air up underneath the power ring, but not inside of the scope. There's more bubbles coming out now. Yep, here comes one. Again, right there, same place. I'm gonna turn that power ring, move some of that air out, dunk it again. A few little bubbles there, but nothing like a, a steady stream. In fact, the bubbles that are there aren't even breaking loose and coming up. One is getting close. <laughs> it looks like it wants to launch. Boink, there it comes. One little bubble right there. A little bit of oil in with it from up underneath. I'm sure they've got a little bit of oil in there. There's another bubble right there. Look inside that, see if there's any fishes swimming around in there. Don't see any. Looks pretty good. Of course, you can leave it in there for as long as you want to really test it. But I think for most of us, just the idea that you could fall into a creek, for instance, get rained on, and your scope's not gonna get a bunch of water in it. So a tiny little leak somewhere might not be a big deal for you. Most of us take pretty good care of our scopes and our rifles when it's wet out. But hey, if they're guaranteed waterproof, I don't know what kind of luck you'd have sending this thing back to the factory. I'm imagining this is made in China. Um, I don't, I didn't even look to see if there was a warranty or anything on it for $30. I wouldn't even bother. Heck, you'll pay more than $30 to ship it back for repairs. You might as well just buy another one. Yeah, I'm getting that bubble again right here under the power ring and one here at this ring. So there may be some entering into this scope. I'm gonna leave it in there for, gosh, maybe an hour. I'll come back out, check it. All right, it's been sitting out here for about an hour. I don't see any bubbles coming out in the stream at all. Got some drippy drips on the outside, but hasn't wilted. I don't see any minnows. Well, it looks like it's doing pretty well. Shake it off here. Looks nice and clear. Don't see any water inside the instrument. I think it's waterproof, guys. Man, pretty amazing. If you guys are looking for an inexpensive scope, you want to take your chances? I think I would for $30, especially on, say, 270 and lighter. 223s, 22250, 243s, 6.5s, that category. I don't think you should have any issues. I wouldn't put it on a dangerous game rifle. You want to make darn sure you've got the equipment that's going to work, but by golly, a $30 scope standing up to that kind of recoil and all of the shooting that we've done with that 6.5 PRC and the precision we got from the 22 is just amazing. I would have laughed this thing right off the planet. In fact, I did when I saw that ad for $30. I thought, what a joke, what a piece of plastic trash this is going to be, but here we are. <laughs> a $30 scope off of a 375 H&H. You learn something new every day. And now, it's tip of the week. And this week's tip is, just as you don't judge a book by its cover, probably shouldn't judge a scope by its asking price because this $30 piece of wonderment really surprised us. So do your homework, take your chances, but by golly, every once in a while, you find a real bargain. Now, if you guys are enjoying these shows, we'd sure appreciate it if you would subscribe to Ron Spomer Outdoors on YouTube. You can also check out our podcast channel on your favorite podcatchers as well as on YouTube and go to ronspomeroutdoors.com, our website, and see all sorts of fun articles and photos and videos there. Appreciate it, guys. See you next time. Hananas and shoot straight. Mm -hmm.